A mulher branca. The apartment was strewn with empty bottles. There was nothing new there. Demetrio was a heavy drinker and Christiana was an enabler, though she didn't see it that way. The life they'd built together was Hobbesian, nasty, brutish and short. That night they'd had another argument. It had started, as usual, over nothing. Demetrio had misplaced his bottle opener and Christiana was too high to help him find it. She'd never been much of a drinker, but one of Demetrio's friends had introduced her to pills and she'd soon learned that they took the edge off. That meant that their arguments were largely one-sided, with Demetrio barking in his girlfriend's face as she tried desperately to calm him down, except for those times when she was too high to try. After the argument about the bottle opener, Demetrio had pulled on his favourite leather jacket and stormed out of the apartment, smashing a bottle of bud against the living room wall as he went. Christiana watched as shards of glass tumbled down onto the uncarpeted floor, while the yeasty residue of what was left of the beer dribbled inexorably down the wall towards the plug socket in the skirting board. Then she patted down her pockets in search of a baggie. She had a little gear left somewhere. Demetrio had rules about what she could and couldn't do on nights like this, when he'd left her in the apartment so he could drink himself into oblivion at Yannick's, the dingiest shit heap of a bar in their dingy shit heap of a town. Christiana wasn't allowed to leave the house without him, not even to grab a loaf of bread or to score, and when Demetrio was at Yannick's, he expected her to clean the house, or at the very least to throw some bleach around and to sweep up the broken glass. And so she made a token effort to tidy up as best as she could and then retreated to the bedroom. The bed hadn't been made, but that didn't matter. Why bother making it when she was just going to crawl back into it anyway? But first she had one last job to do. She raided a secret stash that she kept inside a hollowed out copy of the Bible and laid out all of the baggies on the dressing table, which was cluttered with brushes, makeup, bottles and overflowing ashtrays. Sweeping the detritus aside, she cleared a space the size of a magazine and set to work. It was tedious and time consuming, unpleasant but not quite as bad as picking up cigarette butts and emptying the tobacco out to make a smoke. She opened up one baggie after another, slitting them open with her ragged fingernails, and then tapped out whatever powder residue she could. She counted the bags out in her head, reaching 14 by the time that she hit the last bag and tapped out the milligram or so of powder that was inside it. Then she took out her driver's license and cut the powder into a line. There was as much dust and grime as there was powder, but that didn't matter. She got enough of a hit for it to take the edge off. Then she retired to her bedroom, where she collapsed onto her bed like a sack of potatoes being thrown over a farmer's shoulder. The downers were working. She was asleep within a couple of minutes. When Christiana woke up, she wasn't alone. Demetrio, she murmured, is that you? There was no reply, but somehow she knew that it wasn't. She'd always been proud of her ability to sense vibes. It was a required skill, one that had kept her alive. And the vibes were off. When Demetrio got back from the bar, there was usually a subtle reek of alcohol fumes, smoke and women's perfume, as well as a sense of pent-up aggression and wounded masculinity. Christiana didn't see auras, but if she'd been able to see Demetrio's, then she was pretty sure it would have been red with anger. If she'd had to put a colour on this one, she would have said that it was white. Her eyes opened, slowly at first as she fought against the gown that had gathered in her sleep. The room was a blur, and so was the presence that had joined her. She reached up and rubbed her palms across her face, clearing the detritus of sleep. In the stories and movies, that was when the apparition would have disappeared, leaving her wondering whether it had ever been there in the first place. But this was real life, not a horror movie. With her eyes cleared, she could better see what had woken her up. She had a visitor, a woman in white, a mulher branca. The woman was ageless, her face hard to define as though Christiana was looking at her through fog. Her clothes were a white so pure that they seemed to shimmer in the darkness, the streetlights on the other side of the window staining it a faint yellow because they weren't as pure as the woman's dress was. It might have been a wedding dress, but then again it might not have been. Christiana was still lying back in bed, propped up on a crusty pillow that had needed replacing for years. She moved her head slightly to watch the woman's progress as she floated towards her. The woman's legs didn't move because they didn't need to. She passed through matter as if it didn't matter and Christiana supposed that to the woman in white it didn't. She felt no fear and she asked herself why that was. There was just something that told her that the apparition meant her no harm. It wasn't there to hurt her, it was there to watch. She fell back to sleep with a woman in white watching over her and had dreams of Elysian fields and peaceful walks through the Portuguese countryside. The following morning, Christiana woke up with a clear head for the first time in as long as she could remember, though she could still feel the drugs and her little booze in her system. She could smell booze too, but it wasn't coming from her. Demetrio was passed out in the bed beside her, snoring heartily and sweating out something that smelled like Singer Verga. She climbed out of bed while Demetrio was still snoring beside her, then made herself a cup of instant coffee and went to drink it on the balcony. 
Afterwards, she jumped in the shower, and she was brewing a second when Demetrio emerged from the bedroom, his eyes red and bleary from the previous night's excesses. Puta que pari, Christiana murmured. Demetrio, you look like death. I feel like it too, Christiana, he said. He took the coffee from her hands, and she wondered whether he thought she'd made it for him, or he just didn't care. Either way, the end result was the same, although at least his black moods were a little better in the mornings. It wasn't until the early afternoon that his cravings started to kick in, and whether he satiated them or not, she was usually the one who had to foot the bill for them. It's a beautiful day, Christiana said. It looks it, Demetrio replied. Perhaps I'll take my coffee on the balcony with you. Give me a couple of minutes and I'll brew another one, then I'll come and join you. Demetrio grunted, and Christiana matched her actions to her words. She glanced down at her watch as she walked out onto the balcony to join him, and saw that it was almost 11am. For Demetrio and Christiana, that was early. You were an asshole again last night, she said, sitting down on one of the wooden chairs that they like to smoke on. You know that, right? I know, Demetrio replied, lighting a cigarette and taking a drag on it before passing it across to her. I'm sorry, something came over me. Something always comes over you, Demetrio, Christiana said. You can't keep on doing this. You'll end up killing me. Or myself. Exactly, Christiana replied, and my heart couldn't take that. Despite everything you've put me through, I still love you. And I love you too, Demetrio said. That's why I'm telling you this. What? You're going to think I'm crazy, Demetrio said, lighting a cigarette of his own and taking a deep drag from it. He looked over at Christiana, who was staring back at him with an eyebrow raised. Go on, she said. He sighed. I've been having these dreams, Demetrio said. I keep getting visited by this, this thing. It looks like me, but I know that it isn't. It's something else, something bad, and it talks to me. What does it say? It says that it feeds off the bonds between people, Demetrio replied. It's trying to break the two of us apart. Why bother, Christiana replied. If we keep going like this, it just has to wait. Some time passed, weeks at first, and then the months rolled by. Christiana got clean, and then she relapsed again. Demetrio spent less time at Yannick's, but that just meant he spent more time sitting around at the house in his wife fronts with a bottle of beer in his hand. He started a new job, tossing a wrench around at an illegal chop shop, but he got fired after a couple of weeks for pinching parts in his lunchbox, like Johnny Cash in One Piece at a Time. Mostly, life just continued, as it always did. It was still Hobbesian, but with a Henry James twist. Demetrio was still having his dreams, and Christiana had rediscovered religion. One evening, as summer rolled into autumn, the two of them were enjoying a rare moment of relative normality. Christiana was high, and Demetrio was drunk, and the two of them had collapsed into a heap on the sofa. They'd flicked lazily through the channels for a while, switching from the news to the music channels before settling in for a rerun of Exorcist 2, The Heretic. It wasn't great, but that wasn't the point. It gave them something to stare at while Demetrio lifted an endless procession of brown bottles to his lips and Christiana nodded out. The lights were off and the volume was up high. Neither of them had said a word since the opening credits, but then the noises began. Did you hear that? Demetrio asked. What's that? I don't know what it is, Demetrio said. That's why I'm asking you. Hmm... Fucking junkie, he growled, slapping her several times in the face to bring her round, hitting her just a little bit harder than he needed to. Listen, Christiana, do you hear it? I, uh, listen. Demetrio muted the television and the two of them fell silent. With nothing to get in the way of it, the noise was much more apparent. It was human, but only just. A clearly female sound that formed a wordless drone, a line of capital A's like a place marker in a document. Ah... Uh... It wasn't a scream, but nor was it a whisper. It was the kind of noise that someone might make at the dentist when they were asked to open wide. What is it? Christiana asked. I don't know, Demetrio replied, but it's not coming from the TV. Go and look. Puerta Andy. Well, I'm not going. Demetrio looked at her for a moment, but Christiana stared right back at him. He scowled. Puta, he spat. Fine, I'll go, but I'm getting another beer while I'm up. There were no arguments or violence that night, but after they finished their movie and dragged themselves through into the bedroom, the noise disappeared to be replaced by a scratching noise from outside the window. It sounded like the branches of a tree scraping against the glass, but there were no trees on the other side of it. Demetrio got up a couple of times to go for a piss, and he poked his head out the window both times to see if there was anything there. There wasn't. But when the two of them woke up in the morning, Christiana gasped and pointed a finger at him. You've got scratches all over your back, she said. Did I do that? When? Demetrio replied. We haven't had sex for months. Then who did? Christiana asked. Have you been sleeping with someone else? No. I thought not, Christiana said. You drink too much. You can hardly get it up. 
Demetrio bowled his hands into a fist and raised his right hand, but Cristiano was too tired to flinch back and she just sat there. He unballed his fist and loaded again. Hitting a woman who wasn't trying to stop him was like kicking a puppy or stealing the proverbial baby's candy. I'm going for a shower, Demetrio growled, still thinking about candy. Knock yourself out, Cristiano said. Please do. You first, Demetrio replied. I'm sure you got some pills that'll do the job. He didn't wait for a reply, turning his scratched up back on her and heading into the bathroom. He locked the door behind him. It didn't occur to Demetrio to bend his body like a circus contortionist to try to look at his back in the little beauty mirror above the sink. If it had, he would have seen how bad the scratches were. And then he wouldn't have howled like a cat in heat when the hot water washed over the wounds. A couple more weeks passed and Christiana and Demetrio's relationship continued along in its rocky trajectory. They broke up twice and made up both times, though without consummation. They made up, but they didn't make out. Demetrio was still unemployed and still drinking, but he'd found himself a new project. One evening, after the return of the wordless drone when the two of them had been listening to an 80s special on one of the music channels, he'd headed up into their tiny attic in search of its source. It was more of a storage loft than an attic, barely three feet high and with a rough footprint of a small car, but they still called it the attic because that's how it had been described to them by the estate agent. They rarely used it, other than to store stuff that they no longer needed, but which they didn't want to throw out in case they changed their minds. Demetrio hadn't found the source of the noise, but he hadn't expected to. Instead, he climbed back down the rickety rope ladder with a laptop computer in his hands. Careful, Christiana said. You might fall. I haven't had that much. Still, she replied, if you slip and break your neck, the cops will never believe I had nothing to do with it. Very funny, Demetrio said. I'm not joking. Demetrio spent most of that night in the living room, taking the laptop apart with tiny screwdrivers and fiddling with the different parts to see what could be salvaged. He was mostly interested in the hard drive, just to see what was on there. He hadn't used the machine since his teens, back in the MSN Messenger days. He wasn't quite drunk, but he was one or two sheets to the wind and it was intricate work, especially for a guy who knew less about computers than he'd like to admit. He was so engrossed with his work that he didn't notice that the TV had gone into standby and he was sitting in silence. For her part, Christiana was relaxing on the bed, staring blankly at the ceiling as though the shadows that drifted slowly across it were a theatrical performance. She watched the shadows most nights, marvelling at the way that they changed from one night to another, depending upon who and what went past the streetlights. Christiana, Demetrio called. Christiana, come in here. What? Just get in here, he repeated. You're not going to believe this. So tell me again what happened, Christiana said. It was the following day, and Demetrio was still shaking. Part of that was likely due to the trembling madness, the delirium tremens that came like a scheduled train to any heavy drinker who decided to give up the bottle. Whatever Demetrio had seen had scared him sober. I can't, Christiana, Demetrio replied, lifting his cigarette to his lips and sucking at the filter as though his life depended on it. It's too... too... Okay, Christiana said. Then let me see if I've got it straight. Do you have to? Yes, Christiana replied. Let's see. You were in the living room and I was in the bedroom. You looked up from what you were doing. I was fixing that laptop. And you saw me standing in the doorway and staring at you, only it wasn't me. It was you, but it wasn't you, Demetrio said. I don't know, Christiana, I can't explain it. It looked like you and had the same face, hair and PJs, but somehow it wasn't you. It was something else. And then it turned around and walked into the bedroom. Yeah, Demetrio replied. That's when I called out to you. Didn't you see her? Uh-uh. Christiana said, shaking her head. I mean, sure, I wasn't exactly looking at the doorway, but I could see it from the corner of my eye. And when I heard you call my name, I turned to look. It was only a couple of metres away. I would have seen if someone had walked in. I don't think this was a someone, Demetrio replied. It was a something. Are you sure you weren't just drunk? Yes, Demetrio said. I mean, no, I know I was drunk, but I also know what I saw. I wonder. That night, Christiana called her mother, Raina, and told her what had happened. Christiana, sweet girl, her mother said. It sounds like you have a Karin. A what? The Germans call it a doppelganger, Rainer replied. The Americans might call it an evil twin. But what is it? It's a spirit, Rainer said. An evil one, hell-bent on taking your identity. They feed off negative energy, and Lord knows there's plenty of that in that house of yours. You've never liked Demetrio, Christiana said. He's never given me a reason to like him, Rainer replied. Listen to me, child. The Karin seeks to harm you, to take your place. If you let it have its way, it will kill you, you hear me? And then it will kill Demetria. Why? Because you don't have the courage to end things, Rainer said. Something has to die, Christiana. Let it be your relationship, I beg of you. I... Please, Christiana. I've got to go, she said. Demetria is here. 
I can't believe you went crying to your mother, Demetrio growled. We're a team, remember? We need to sort our problems out together. I know, Demetrio, Christiana replied. The two of them were sitting out on the balcony, soaking up the early evening rays. She reached over to the table, picked up a cigarette, shook one loose from the pack and lit it. It's not like that, I promise. I just wanted some advice. And what to do about me? And what to do about a mulher blanca? It's trying to tell us something. She wants to... Enough, Demetrio snapped his hand flying out and forming into a fist in the air before striking a glancing blow against her cheekbone. Christiana let out a startled gasp, then pushed herself backwards and fell off her chair, hitting the floor with a thud that echoed out into the street and rose above the protesting scrape of metal on tile. Demetrio looked down at her, but he didn't offer to help her up. She glared at him and pulled herself to her feet. Her face was stinging already and she knew that a bruise was coming which no amount of makeup would be able to disguise. Not that she still bothered to try. She could feel a different kind of pain in her right hand and realised that she'd crushed her lit cigarette into her palm as she tried to break her fall. You're an a she said, backing towards the door before he could make another lunge at her. And one day, Demetrio, you're going to get what's coming to you. And then she walked out of the door. She walked for hours through the Jardim de Estrella, thinking back to the times that she and Demetrio had followed those same paths with their arms intertwined. That had been before their addictions had taken hold, when they were young and carefree with bright futures ahead of them. So much had changed that it was hard to recognise them as the same people. The sun had set by the time she started walking home, and an unseasonal cold had descended. Christiana could see her breath beneath the streetlights. The walk had helped to clear her head, and the pain in her face and hand had settled down to a steady throb, but she still hadn't made a decision. She knew she had to do something about Demetrio, she just didn't know what. She saw the flashing lights before she saw the police cars. They were parked higgledy-piggledy along the narrow road outside the flat, with an ambulance pulled up close to its entrance. Her heart dropped and she raced across the final hundred yards or so in time to see Demetrio being wheeled into the back of an ambulance on a gurney. His legs were sticking out at unnatural angles and one of his arms was folded behind his back. He looked like a swastika. Tuta merda, she whispered. What happened? Cristiana Delgado? The voice came from behind her and it had a quiet but firm authority to it that had her turning around automatically, though she longed to keep her eyes on Demetrio. She wasn't surprised to see that the voice belonged to a policeman. That's me, she replied. What happened to Demetrio? I think you know very well what happened to him, the officer said. We've been looking for you. One of us, one of your neighbours called us in. You were seen. I don't understand. Come off it, Senora Delgado, the cop replied. We know what happened. We've heard all about your volatile relationship with Demetrio. And is that a fresh bruise coming up on your face? No comment. You pushed him, Senora Delgado, the officer said. Like I said, you were seen. Or are you going to tell me that the neighbours saw a look-alike? Christiana was taken to the police station for processing, where she was held in a cold, dark cell after spending most of the evening and early morning going over her movements of the day before. The officers refused to give her an update on Demetrio's prognosis, but she wasn't surprised. She didn't get much sleep that night. It wasn't until the morning that she was given an explanation. The same cop that she'd spoken to the evening before sat her down in an interview room and introduced himself as Senor Marcio Santos. I'd like to start by making an apology, Santos said, after taking care of the formalities and initialising the recording. It seems that we acted under false information. You think? Like we said, Senora Delgado, we were advised that one of your neighbours saw you push Demetrio from the balcony, he continued. The problem is, we checked some cameras and have confirmation that you were in the Jardin de Estrella when you said you were. I told you, Christiana said. Whatever you're accusing me of, I'm innocent. How's Demetrio? We checked the CCTV cameras on your street, of course, Santos continued, pointedly ignoring the question. Apparently the footage has been corrupted. They were working up until an hour or so before Demetrio fell, and they show a confrontation between the two of you in which he hit you. Can you explain that? There's nothing to explain, Christiana replied. How's Demetrio? And so the riddle we're trying to solve goes a little bit like this, Santos said. We have multiple witnesses who said that they saw you, or someone like you, pushing Demetrio from the balcony. We also have footage that shows you to be on the other side of the city. So what happened? It must have been her. Who? Amul Herbranca. Of course, Santos said. Your mother said you might say something about that. I'm afraid we don't have jurisdiction over ghosts. You've talked to my mother? Yes. How's Demetrio? Demetrio is dead, Christiana. Christiana gasped, although she'd been expecting that answer. He hadn't looked too good when the paramedics had loaded him into the ambulance. She paused for a moment or two to gather her thoughts and to take a sip of the water that Santos had provided for her. There hadn't been any water the night before. 
So, she said, what's next? We release you, Santos replied. But let me make myself clear, we'll be watching you. Why? We know that you had something to do with this, Santos explained. We just can't prove it. You can think what you'd like, Christiana replied. But I know better. I know I didn't kill Demetrio. Then who did? A mulher branca, Christiana repeated. But she knew that the officer wouldn't believe her. 